In 2002, scientists from Stanford University used satellite tracking tags to monitor the movements of great white sharks off the coast of California. The purpose of this study was to shed light on the disappearance of white sharks in the winter months and led to the discovery of a mysterious area now referred to as White Shark Cafe. Each fall, white sharks prey on the abundance of pinnipeds found along the California coastline some of which migrate to the area themselves to breed. The tracking data showed that great whites then leave the coast in the winter and travel far out to sea. Some individuals make it as far as Hawaii, but most congregate in an area between these two locations. This area was once thought to lack any significant food source, but is now being shown to host a complete food chain, which the sharks are believed to exploit through deep diving. Data collected in 2018 shows that males and females exhibit distinct behaviours at the site, and while further study is required, it is thought that both foraging and breeding could be the main drivers behind this migratory behaviour. In the year following this research, another groundbreaking study unfolded on land. Prior to 2019, it was assumed that caribou make the longest terrestrial migration but this was based on little empirical evidence. That was until a study published in the Journal of Scientific Reports compared the movements of various mammal species using GPS datasets to establish the longest terrestrial migrations and movements around the world. Caribou spend their summers at high latitudes to amongst other reasons minimize their exposure to predation during calving season. As the harsh winter conditions begin to set in, most of the caribou migrate to a more hospitable location. As the snow begins to melt in the spring, exposing new food sources and a viable path back to their calving grounds, they begin the return journey, which has now been verified at a straight line distance between migratory endpoints of over 1200 kilometers round trip. While this study confirmed that caribou do indeed exhibit the longest migratory movements of any terrestrial mammal, it also showed that some species exhibit an even greater total annual movement, defined as the sum of the distances between successive relocations. Across the vast grasslands of Mongolia, a grey wolf was clocked at over 7,000 kilometers of total distance covered. This movement is classed as territorial though, not migratory. They also found that populations of Mongolian wild ass or kulan traveled significantly more than the caribou at over 6,000 kilometers per year, but this movement is classed as nomadic. While all of these distances are impressive, they pale in comparison to the migratory journeys undertaken by certain marine and bird species. Over 5,000 kilometers to the south in Hawaii, this playful part of Wales is showing off to a tiny humpback calf. Breeding locations for humpbacks are widely distributed throughout the equatorial regions of the world's oceans. These warmer waters provide a more hospitable environment to nurse their calves over the winter months, and with the gestation period for whales being just under one year, for those who are old enough to mate, it is also where breeding takes place. While these idyllic tropical waters are a great place to spend the winter, in the vast majority of cases, these locations lack the resources needed to survive year-round, and so as spring approaches, the long migratory journey to colder, more bountiful waters must begin. The exact feeding ground and the distance in between differs depending on the population, but for some these journeys can be up to 8,000 kilometers in a single direction. Once complete, the summer months will be spent building up fat stores in their blubber by feasting on small crustaceans and fish before making the long journey back to the tropics. In 2013, a female grey whale was estimated to have made a very rare migration, exceeding 22,000 kilometers, setting a new record for mammal migration, but even this journey is dwarfed by those with the ability to fly. The Arctic tern breeds and raises its young in the Arctic and subarctic regions during the Northern Hemisphere's summer. Once complete, this tiny bird, which weighs around 100 grams, then begins its endless pursuit of summer, 
capitalizing on the plentiful feeding opportunities that come along with it. Chasing the sun's rays, it travels all the way down to the Antarctic to make the most of the southern hemisphere's summer before repeating the process in reverse. Arctic terns are not the only species to undertake this incredible journey. The sooty shearwater also travels between polar regions on a yearly basis, racking up over 60,000 kilometers of total distance traveled. A 2010 study involving a transmitter attached to an Arctic tern revealed that these birds follow a zigzag migration path to make the most of prevailing weather conditions and feeding opportunities. As a result, they clock up in excess of 70,000 kilometers during their round trip. This is thought to be the longest migration on Earth, and over the course of their lifetime, a single bird can travel in excess of 2 million kilometers. Regardless of distance, each migration comes with a unique set of challenges, and Earth's geography often presents some of the most difficult to overcome. While these wildebeest approach the Maasai Mara, it's not just crocodiles and lions on their mind. The challenges faced by these herds on their epic journey are numerous, but there are few as dramatic as the river crossings. There are many smaller obstacles that wildebeest navigate with ease, but the two main crossings that present the greatest challenge are the Mara River in the north and the Grometi on the western side of the migration route. Aside from crocodiles, which represent an obvious threat, Many of the wildebeest, zebra and other animals that attempt these crossings will not make it to the other side. To start with, the erosion from these powerful rivers creates steep vertical banks that must be negotiated themselves before reaching the water's edge. Once a viable crossing point has been found, the exact depth of the river is still unknown and many individuals are swept away with the current. Researchers found that mass drownings of over 100 individuals occurred in 13 of the 15 years studied, with an average of over 6,000 wildebeest passing away at the Mara crossing alone. Mountains are another geographical feature that are notoriously hard to traverse, and often defined by a geographical boundaries, preventing many animals from migrating any further. That said, there are also many species that thrive in this environment, and there is even a category of migration that describes their seasonal use of these mountainous ecosystems. Altitudinal migration refers to the movement between different altitudes as a response to changes in seasonal conditions. A 2017 study published in the Journal of Field Ornithology found that 1,238 birds, or over 10% of all species, exhibit this behavior. Birds also have the luxurious advantage of being able to fly over the mountains that lie between their migratory endpoints, and no species exhibits this behavior in a more spectacular fashion than the bar-headed goose. These birds fly directly over the tallest mountain range on Earth, the Himalayas, and have been recorded as high as 24,000 feet. This altitude is the highest migration ever recorded, and it is even more impressive when you consider that these birds fly for up to 17 hours, some of which is at altitudes referred to by humans as the death zone. At this point, it's fairly clear that birds are the masters of migration, but there is one non-avian aerial migration, the subject of legend, that if true, is arguably the most impressive migration on Earth. As part of its migratory route from India to East Africa, the globe skimmer dragonfly is hypothesized to make the journey from the Maldives to Somalia in one single shot, a distance of over 2,000 kilometers. Weighing just 300 milligrams and measuring a little under two inches long, the globe skimmer is difficult to track, but no doubt built for migratory flight, with their light, powerful wing spanning three inches in width. If this route is undertaken, when compared to body size, it would be the longest regular non-stop migratory flight known to mankind. The introduction of a significant number of any species into an ecosystem can initiate a cascade, leading to both positive or negative effects for other organisms. Every year, the colorful kokanee or sockeye salmon of the North Pacific make their way from the ocean into freshwater ecosystems along the coastline to spawn. 
In Alaska, this happens around late June, and the arrival of these fish set off a cascade of other migratory behaviors, including the congregation of bears along the river. According to the US Park Service, bears in Katmai National Park have just six to eight months to consume enough food to ensure survival for a whole year, and the salmon run presents one of the best opportunities to fatten up on high quality food source before fall quickly approaches. Some bears have been known to eat over two tons of salmon in a single summer, and when these fish are plentiful, they will consume as little as 25% of the carcass, which they deposit on riverbanks and fields. Numerous other animals then benefit by scavenging these carcasses, including eagles, owls, martens, and mink. Moreover, the nutrients of these partially consumed carcasses enrich the soil, contributing to a richer and more diverse plant life. Thus, a decrease in the migratory populations of prey animals such as salmon can have a devastating ripple effect across an entire ecosystem. The health of an ecosystem, as well as the addition of human infrastructure, can in a similar fashion also influence the migratory routes taken by animals. There is one population of pronghorn that undertakes the longest terrestrial migration in the continental United States. These animals make the 240-kilometer journey from Grand Teton National Park in the north, where they spend their summer, to Green River Valley in the south, where they spend their winter. Pronghorn use the same migratory routes each year, and while some objects such as fences and walls present more obvious obstructions, others have a more subtle but no less intriguing effect. Multiple studies show that both habitat type and human-built features have an effect on migratory behavior, including the selection of stopover locations and the speed of migration. In one study, sagebrush, which makes up a large portion of the pronghorn diet, was shown to have the strongest influence over migratory routes. After accounting for habitat type, although wind turbines were shown not to pose a barrier to migration, they were shown to exhibit the strongest negative influence during spring migration by speeding up the pace of travel and decreasing the amount of time spent at stopover locations where the pronghorn feed. Animal migration can also influence human behavior and have a positive effect on the economy as animals pass through a local area on their spectacular journey. Sandhill cranes spend their winters in the southern states and northern Mexico before migrating north en masse to their breeding grounds in Canada and Alaska. There are several stopover locations used by the cranes, one of which is the San Luis Valley of Colorado, whose wetlands play host to tens of thousands of birds, making quite the spectacle for tourists. A study conducted in 2021 surveyed groups of visitors at popular viewing locations and estimated that 7,500 groups passed through the valley specifically for the crane migration contributing well over $3 million to the local economy from money spent on hotel rooms, food, gas, shopping, and other sources, proving that taking steps to preserve these migrations is not only important for the animals themselves, but can have a positive return on investment for local authorities. Animals exhibit a wide range of behaviors to better cope with the strains of migration, including traveling in an efficient manner, ensuring arrival at the correct location, and the ability to perform the function for which they migrated in the first place. For birds, especially those traveling long distances, efficiency is the name of the game, and there are several tactics for ensuring the most efficient flight. Perhaps the most famous is the flying V formation, used by geese, pelicans, swans, and many others. With the exception of the leader, which is rotated out periodically, each bird in the formation benefits from the uplift of the bird in front. In 2021, scientists attached heart rate monitors to a group of pelicans and confirmed that the heart rates of those flying in formation could be up to 10% lower than those flying solo. It was also observed that on average, these birds flap less often and glide more often. And when calculated together, these factors resulted in an estimated 14% energy expenditure saving from flying in groups. Other birds fly at specific times of day to increase efficiency. 
Some do so during the day to utilize thermals or take advantage of daytime food sources, and others, most notably songbirds, fly at night to make use of the calmer, cooler conditions and to avoid predation. Group behavior has a number of benefits and is sometimes exhibited only when migrating. One of Australia's most spectacular migrations takes place each year as the usually solitary giant cuttlefish congregate for mating season. This species is found all along the southern coast of Australia, but congregates most impressively in Wyala. Here, tens of thousands of individuals migrate from deeper waters in the Spencer Gulf to the shallow ledges of False Bay, where they lay their eggs in between the months of May and August. These animals are sometimes referred to as chameleons of the sea, possessing the ability to change colour both for camouflage and as part of their courtship display. Less dominant males are known to disguise themselves as females and mate while the larger, more dominant males are preoccupied. There are variations of this crafty behaviour throughout the animal kingdom, with individuals who engage in it being known as sneaker males. The most important behavioural trait in ensuring a successful migration is arguably the ability to navigate, and few animals are as skilled as the bat. An experiment in Bulgaria set out to prove that the greater mouse-eared bat uses the Earth's magnetic field to navigate in similar fashion to birds, but that they also use the sunset to calibrate their internal compass. To establish a control, bats were fitted with radio transmitters and placed 25 kilometers from their roost. They were quickly able to determine the correct direction and return to the roost in as little as two hours. Researchers then used a piece of equipment known as a Helmholtz coil, which produces a uniform magnetic field to artificially rotate the magnetic field that half of the bats were exposed to by 90 degrees. Both groups were able to observe the sunset and then were released. The control bats correctly navigated home, while those exposed to the adjusted magnetic field flew 90 degrees in the wrong direction. The experiment was then repeated, but was done so at night after the sun had set. All of the bats navigated home correctly, leading researchers to the conclusion that the bat's magnetic compass is recalibrated at sunset, which gives a clear indication of which direction is west. Another experiment exposed soprano pipistrel bats to a mirror image of the sunset, which again changed their direction of flight by 180 degrees, suggesting that a combination of directional cues from the sun and the Earth's magnetic field are essential for at least some bat species to navigate. There are many reasons why animals migrate, and the cues that animals use to perform this behaviour can also be fascinating. Spring is on its way in the United Kingdom, and rising temperatures have brought this toad out of her winter dormancy. She must now make the journey from her terrestrial home to her breeding pond, which is more than likely the same body of water in which she was born. If she's lucky, or unlucky, she'll pick up a male along the way, who assumes a mating position known as Amplexus and is small enough to be carried the rest of the way while doing so. A 1998 study conducted over a 19-year period showed that regardless of the date of arrival, which can vary by almost two months, there needs to be a mean daily temperature above 6 degrees C in the preceding 40-day period, in addition to a minimum of 9 hours of daylight suggesting that a combination of rising temperatures and longer daylight hours trigger the migratory behaviour in common toads. Once mating is complete and the tadpoles have hatched, they develop lungs and legs over the course of two to three months, and are then ready to make their own migration from the breeding pond to land, where they begin their terrestrial lifestyle. It will then be several years before they mature and are ready to return to the water to follow in the footsteps of their mother and father. While seasonal migrations are perhaps the most well-known, other examples of migratory behaviour occurring on a more frequent basis also warrant attention. One such example is tidal migration. As the tide recedes, shorebirds such as sanderlings, plovers and dunlins flock to the intertidal zone to feast on small crustaceans and other invertebrates, which themselves are undertaking their own form of tidal migration. 
At high tide, these prey animals retreat deep into their burrows, then migrate vertically to feed as the tide drops. Shorebirds in turn migrate horizontally between periods of resting and feeding as the opportunity presents itself. For the invertebrates, this movement leads them into a cycle of predation, an ecological consequence of their own migration. Although such behaviours can increase predation risk, there are rare instances of migratory behaviour reducing such exposure. This group of roaches blissfully gorging on the insects at the surface has caught the attention of a group of talented fishermen. Cormorants represent a significant predation risk for many freshwater fish, possessing the ability to dive in search of food. Published in 2013 in a study conducted over a four-year period, researchers in Scandinavia tagged 2,000 fish and monitored their migratory behaviour. Predation was quantified by recovering transponder tags from cormorant roosts and showed that the risk of predation was lower for fish that migrated into streams over those who remained in the lake during the winter. Whether or not the fish migrated specifically to avoid predation is still unknown, but this study does provide substantial evidence that migration can lead to lower predation rates and was one of the first to quantify the effect of migration on predation avoidance. Interestingly, the avoidance of predation is one of the primary drivers behind the world's largest migration, which doesn't take place in the sky, nor does it occur on land. It can be observed on a daily basis in aquatic ecosystems, as trillions of organisms around the world ascend and descend the water column in synchronization with the sun. This behavior is most commonly associated with various types of zooplankton, which ascend in pursuit of food under the cover of darkness, and then descend to avoid predation, which is more common in well-lit conditions. This phenomenon is known as deal vertical migration. Like the wide mouth of whale sharks used for filter feeding, many animals have specific biological adaptions used to benefit them during their migration, and others that dictate migratory behavior. Summer in Antarctica runs from January to March and is an important time of year for the continent's most famous residents. It is during these months that emperor penguins feast on silverfish, krill and squid in preparation for the tough breeding season ahead. As fall approaches at the end of March, emperor penguins begin their migration inland, which can be up to 160 kilometers in distance, to a location where the ice is stable and not likely to break up. Although this trek is arduous, Antarctica measures 5,500 kilometers at its widest point, so the migratory map is a lot less dramatic than it might seem. It is here, however, where courtship and mating begins. Once successful, the female will lay the egg from late April to mid-May and immediately hand it off to the male, who uses a patch of skin on his belly to incubate it during the cold winter months. With her parental responsibilities completed for now, the female makes the trek back across the ice to the ocean to feed, while the males endure the brutal Antarctic conditions by using their fat stores for energy while huddling together and switching positions to share exposure to the wind. Hatching occurs a little after two months in mid-July, around the same time as the females are returning from feeding. Once the male and chick have been located, an impressive feed in and of itself, the chick is handed off to the female, and the hungry, exhausted male now takes his turn to trek across the ice to the ocean to feed. From September to November, the pair will take turns trekking to the ocean and feeding the chick by regurgitating the food. At five months of age, the chick is now old enough to fend for itself, and after molting its warm down feathers, is ready to make the journey to the ocean for its first seaborne adventure. It is thanks to these biological adaptations that the emperor penguin can survive in Antarctica and undergo one of the world's most renowned migrations. Biological factors can also play their part in determining where animals migrate to. Each year, sea turtles migrate from their feeding grounds to beaches around the world to breed. Some leatherback turtles exhibit one of the longest reptile migrations, 
traveling from their breeding grounds in Indonesia and crossing the entire Pacific Ocean to their feeding grounds on the west coast of the United States. Other species such as the hawksbill undertake shorter migrations, but one biological factor links both of these species. Unlike most animals whose gender is determined during fertilization, the gender of many reptiles including sea turtles is determined after fertilization, a concept known as temperature-dependent sex determination. For sea turtles, the temperature of the sand in which the eggs are laid influences the gender ratio of the hatchlings. Generally, cooler temperatures produce more males and warmer temperatures result in more females, with a transitional range of temperatures producing both sexes. This temperature dependency places constraints on suitable nesting locations, and scientists are currently researching how these patterns might be adjusted in response to changes in global temperatures. In a previous video, we discussed the multi-generational migration of monarch butterflies from Mexico to the northern United States and Canada. This spectacle is one of the most well-known insect migrations, but studies now suggest an even more impressive journey undertaken by the monarch's Afro-Eurasian cousin, the Painted Lady. In 2009, radars were used at the end of the summer to confirm these butterflies exited the UK, a distinction that was previously difficult to confirm due to the altitude at which these butterflies travel at to take advantage of prevailing winds. Between 2017 and 2020, winter sites in sub-Saharan Africa were studied to assess the extent of the migration. It was found that the tropical forests of Central Africa represented the southernmost barrier to this migration. As this species has been recorded as far north as the Arctic Circle in northern Norway, this 14,500 km multi-generational migration could be more than double the length of that of the monarch butterfly, which you can learn about in this video, along with the many implications of size in the animal kingdom. Thank you so much for watching.